Welcome, finally, to the last canto of the Inferno and the center of hell. Now, let me exhort you, please, not to stay in hell by ending your journey with Dante here. To do so would turn his comedy into a tragedy. Now, instead, push on to purgatory, a realm marked by grace, love, and forgiveness, where sinners like us reform their loves, cultivate the virtues, and ready themselves for the final destination, paradise, where the redeemed enjoy the friendship, beauty, and dance of the triune God of love. Now, this final canto ends the Inferno and prepares us for Purgatorio. It's the only canto 34 in the comedy. The first canto functions as a prologue to the whole, leaving 33 canticles for the rest of the Inferno. By now, you'll know the importance and ubiquity of the number three. There are three canticles of essentially 33 cantos each. His tertiarima rhyme scheme has three rhymes per sound. He writes in tercets of three lines, and each line has 11 syllables, meaning 33 syllables for each tercet. Every sentence in the entire comedy is either three, six, or nine lines long. These are some of the features that leave me pretty dumbfounded uh, when I approach the comedy. Uh, there are also three ladies that assist him, Mary, Lucia, and Beatrice, three guides, Virgil, Beatrice, and St. Bernard. He's examined by three apostles in the three theological virtues, and there are nine sections to hell, purgatory, and heaven, and lots of other threes and multiples of three that I'll leave you to find on your own. Now, why? Well, the comedy is structured and suffused with threes because the cosmos is structured and stewarded by the three-person God. In the triune God, we live and move and have our being, you and me and Dante. And as Paul writes in Romans 1, God's invisible attributes, eternal power, and divine nature are in some way suffused into the things that have been made. Dante acknowledges this mystery by weaving threes into the structure, story, and poetics of the comedy. Even more importantly, three represents the love shared between the persons of the triune God and with their good creation. Dante's God, we might say, does not exist in ungodlike isolation. But Dante also uses three to help us see into the nature and activity of evil. See, we also see corrupt threes. Three creatures block his way. The three-headed Kerberos deafens the ears of the gluttonous. There are three major types of sin, three furies. There's a tripartite Geryon. Three rivers feed Cossetus. And in this canto, we meet the three-faced Lucifer. Uh, some of you may recognize St. Augustine's idea of provatio boni here, that evil is not creative or generative, but it's parasitical corrupting, a privation of the good that distorts the good that exists prior to it. But because we're still seduced by these corruptions, the gruesome parts of the inferno are intended to shock us into recognition and moral revulsion toward the sin and vice that corrupts our originally good humanity and human communities. See, contrary to some assumptions, Dante's not writing to indulge his own or anyone else's disordered fascination with evil, pain, or train-wrecked lives. He's not writing a slasher film nor a gossipy tabloid. And he never lingers on the punishment of any one sinner, even when it's the archenemy of God on the night of Holy Saturday in the deepest pit of hell. Now, Holy Saturday... The only full 24-hour day that Christ spent entombed when all hope must have seemed lost to his followers. On Holy Saturday, 1300, Dante and Virgil walked to the fourth part of the frozen Lake Cossetus called Judica after Judas Iscariot, who, like Lucifer, betrayed his benefactor. In Judas's case, God the Son, and in Lucifer's, God the Father. Dante admits he lacks the words to describe what he felt in Lucifer's presence. He only writes that he was frozen and faint, deprived of death and bereft of life. But though Dante calls Lucifer a lamparador de doloroso regno, the emperor of the world of pain in Stan Lombardo's translation, or the king of all the vast kingdom of grief in Mark Muses, 
The Lucifer Dante met is not Milton's romantic Satan swaggering and speech making before he assaults heaven. He's not the Greek Hades, nor the powerful Roman god Pluto or Dis. He's not the clever trickster from Goethe's Faust, nor the suave Professor Volan from Bulgakov's The Master and Margarita. Lucifer is enormous, yes. He's horrifying, yes. His three faces are chomping on three centers, yes. But he's also a crying, slobbering, impotent, hideous creature who locks himself in his own frozen prison by constantly flapping bat-like wings. Sad reminders of the angelic plumage he once enjoyed, but which he now still flaps in a futile effort to ascend and assault heaven. As a moral agent with free choice, Lucifer's own actions landed him here, and because he hasn't repented, keep him here. In addition, he's kind of boring. He's like Ransom in C.S. Lewis's Paralandra, attacking the good creation, ripping open frogs' backs, and endlessly repeating his own name. Because all hell can do is corrupt the more interesting good that preceded it. Again, Augustine's Privatio Boni. The Lucifer here is just chomp, chomp, chomp. This is why Simone Weil comments that whereas imaginary evil is romantic and varied, real evil is gloomy, monotonous, barren, and boring. And whereas imaginary good is boring, real good, she says, is always new, marvelous, and intoxicating. Because you know who's having fun and partying in the comedy? It is not the souls in hell. It's the souls in paradise, where it's all light, music, dance, and conversation. I mean, even the great theologians of the church, Aquinas, Augustine, Albertus Magnus, Hugh of St. Victor, they're compared to dancing ladies waiting for the next song to strike up so they can launch back into another reel. It's like heaven is a great Scottish Cayley with the best musicians you've ever heard in the coolest place you can imagine, with the most interesting people you've never met but always really wanted to. I'm sure some of you know that wonderful description from G.K. Chesterton, comparing the unending enthusiasm of children and the exhaustion of adults. He writes, Because children have a bounding vitality, because they are in spirit fierce and free, therefore they want things repeated and unchanged. They always say, do it again, and the grown-up person does it again until he is nearly dead. For grown-up people are not strong enough to exult in monotony, but God is strong enough to exult in monotony. It is possible that God says every morning, do it again, to the sun, and every evening, do it again, to the moon. It may not be automatic necessity that makes all daisies alike. It may be that God makes every daisy separately, but has never got tired of making them. It may be that he has the eternal appetite of infancy, for we have sinned and grown old, and our father is younger than we. Well, if God and the souls in heaven are young and exuberant, Lucifer and hell are old and tired and, frankly, pretty dull. M many readers feel a little disappointed when they finally meet him at the bottom of the inferno. But maybe that's the point, because he is disappointing. Like the other unrepentant sinners, Lucifer also seems to have lost the good of his intellect, because he appears only barely cognitive, completely unaware of the sinners in his mouth or when our two protagonists climb down his hairy haunches. And as a sad reminder of his failed attempt to displace the triune God, Lucifer has three faces, and then a sad imitation of the Eucharist, like Ugolino munching on the head of Ruggieri, Lucifer gnaws on Brutus and Cassius and Judas. Judas, as I said, because he betrayed his heavenly Lord, Jesus Christ, the head of the kingdom of heaven, and Brutus and Cassius because they betrayed their earthly lord, Julius Caesar, the head of the kingdom of earth, the church and the political order, the kingdom of God and the kingdoms of man, both instituted by God to bring the temporal and eternal peace the world needs. And this underworld king's other courtiers, well, because in life they abandon intimate community through deception, in death they are abandoned to their isolation jammed beneath the ice around their boring lord. Why ice? Well, because heat and fire are symbols of the love this place lacks, instead it is filled with barren ice. And so two cities with two lords and two ultimate destinations emerge from two primary loves. 
as Augustine writes, love of self above all else or love of God above all else. Here, the comedy often provokes me to ask, which of these two cities would be natural homes for my thoughts, desires, and actions? Which of my thoughts, desires, and actions would be welcomed home by the one, but shut out by the other? Would this action, thought, or desire be welcomed by hell as one of its own, but resisted by heaven as entirely foreign? Or would it be scorned by hell and welcomed into heaven? Which of my thoughts, actions, and desires are truly good and which are merely sad perversions? That's the kind of wakeful reflection Dante the poet hopes we practice so that like Dante the pilgrim, we can make our way back to God whenever we find ourselves lost in a dark wood of error. But after a brief look at Lucifer, it's time to move on. So Dante climbs on Virgil's back and they climb feet first down the hairy haunches of Lucifer to the very center of the earth where Virgil then turns his body around and starts climbing up headfirst toward the surface of the world. See, their journey will have taken them from the northern hemisphere where they started through the center of the earth out to the southern hemisphere. And yes, Dante, like everyone in the ancient and medieval world, knew that the world was round. And here, Virgil plays tour guide a little bit, as he often does explaining that when Lucifer was cast down from the outer heavens of the fixed stars, he was flung to the furthest point from the heavens, which in a Ptolemaic universe is at the very center of the earth. But Lucifer was so loathsome to the rest of the creation that when he, when the land on the southern hemisphere saw him coming, it fled to the north. And then when Lucifer was boring through the earth to reach the center, the soil in front of him fled to the southern hemisphere, forming Mount Purgatory leaving that gap in the earth to become hell. This means Mount Purgatory is as tall as hell is deep. And both, remember, are populated by sinners. The inhabitants of hell being unrepentant sinners living without hope of progress. Abandon all hope, you who enter, right? And the inhabitants of Purgatory are repentant sinners living in hope while they progress to their ultimate destination in paradise. Meaning, of course, hell will be forever populated while purgatory will be forever empty. Now, when I used to teach the comedy to high school students in Topeka, Kansas, we would walk down to G's frozen custard to celebrate making it to hell's frozen lake of suffering. I know, I was never quite sure frozen custard was entirely appropriate, but I was also never sure it wasn't. Because by the end of the canto, Dante and Virgil have climbed out of hell to emerge just as Easter morning dawns, leaving death and returning to life and hope and light. And at that moment, they behold the stars, the stars that beckon all repentant sinners ever onward and ever upward toward heaven, or in C.S. Lewis's words that echo Dante, further up and further in to the love of God. And that always seemed like a reason to celebrate. So again, well done making it this far. Maybe get yourself some frozen custard and prepare to continue our journey together, climbing up Mount Purgatory and living in hope of heaven. <laughs>